Thanks, Dan. We're in the book of Hosea, as, as Dan mentioned. It's a small little book in the Old Testament, the first half of the Bible. And if you're a guest with us today, you can go online and catch up if you'd like, or I'll sum up the story. We have some Bibles in the back. You're welcome to grab one. You can keep that if you don't have your own copy. But what you think about God is the most important thing about you. A.W. Tozer in the book, The Knowledge of the Holy. Let me repeat that. What, you, what comes into your mind when you think about God is the most important thing about you. So let me, let me ask you, what, what comes into your mind when you think, when you think of God? This, this book of Hosea, we summed up chapter 3 last week, and we're going to review that. We're going to sum up the rest of the book of Hosea today. Hosea, this weird minor prophet. Let me just catch you up to where we've, where we've been and where we are today. God calls a man named Hosea. He says, Hosea, I want to demonstrate to the people of Israel how much I love them. So I'm going to ask you to go find a woman who's unfaithful, plays the harlot, an adulterous woman, I want you to marry her. That's his first assignment. So he marries her, and then they have three children together. God tells them what to name those three kids. Those three kids' names are Judgment, No Mercy, and Not My People. Really sweet, beautiful kids. And then she continues to be a prostitute out in the, the red light district. And God says, Hosea, I want you to go. I want you to buy her back. So that's Hosea chapters 1, 2, and 3. And Hosea goes and buys her back. For this is a sign of how much God loves the nation of Israel. So I was talking to some, some people this week, and they're like, man, it must be really, really hard to be Hosea. We're not Hosea, just to clarify for everyone in the room. Of the characters in the story, Hosea and Gomer, we're Gomer, all of us in this room. We're the ones running away from God. Hosea plays God pursuing, pursuing us. And the good news is God never stops pursuing us. He continues to search and he continues to look and will pay any price for, for you. So that's, that's Hosea 3. Let me sum up the rest of the book of Hosea. Before I do that, I share with you, I've, this, this book talks a lot about weddings. And I've done couple hundred weddings. I, I get the best seat in the house when it comes to a wedding. I love it. And I've, I've been to some crazy weddings. I've been to some really expensive weddings. I've done weddings out on a mountaintop. I've done weddings during COVID. I was doing all these weddings with like four or five people. because That's the only number of people we could have in the room. Uh, I've done weddings in backyards and at country clubs. And I've done weddings where the pastor was an hour and a half late. Yeah, I've, I've, I've done that. But I get the best seat in the house because I get to stand right next to that groom when the bride comes through the doors or the bride presents herself. The bride starts to walk down the aisle. And I get the view of both, right? So I get to see the bride, but I also get to kind of glance over to the groom. And, you know, the groom's he's tearing up. He's tearing up. He's He's crying. Because he sees his, his bride, this woman that he's, he's dated and he's courted and, and he's given his vows that I'm, I'm going to, I'll die for this woman, right? And I've been doing this long enough where I've, I've done a lot of weddings and it's a highlight and it's, it's amazing, it's fun. I, one of the things I really enjoy doing is pre-marriage counseling. And a lot of times there's, when I'm doing pre-marriage counseling, they, they've got their arm on each other and they're, you know oohing and on and getting lost in each other's eyes and oh you know and I'm asking questions like do you think you'd ever question your love for each other like no there would never I would never question my love for this person right and I've been doing this long enough where in the pre-marriage I'm like hey when when things get tough give me a call oh no we're good right five years goes by 10 years goes by 15 years goes by we've done some marriages 20 years ago and now they're they come back and I get to sit with them. And they might be on the same couch, but they're at opposite ends of the couch now. 
and they, they don't have their arm on each other, and they're not holding hands, and they're not getting lost in each other's eyes. What happened? Same people, the same vows. What happened? Some of, some of you have, have lived through some of the difficulties of that. If you've been married for five minutes, you know what I'm talking about. It's just hard. Marriage is really hard. It's difficult. It's hard. You know how difficult it is for someone to live with me every day? I can barely put up with me. It's, marriage is hard. And yet when God decides to show you how much he loves you. He uses this illustration of marriage. Marriage is different than viewing God as a father. It's viewing God as a king, viewing God as a shepherd. There's something different about viewing Jesus as our husband, church. So that's Hosea chapters 1, 2, and 3. So what, what happens? What happened Well, the same is true with the nation of Israel and the relationship with God. There was a marriage that took place between Israel and God. There's two aspects of this relationship, conditional and unconditional, right? When we stand before uh, God and we say our wedding vows, right, those are unconditional vows in sickness and health. Whatever you do for me or don't do for me, this is what I'm choosing to do for you. And that was the same with God with the nation of Israel. God says, I I will choose to love you, and you will always be my people, and I will be gracious to you. But there was also a conditional element with the nation of Israel. If you've heard of maybe the Ten Commandments, anybody ever heard of the Ten Commandments? There were some laws that God gave. He's like, hey, I'm I'm just going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to follow me, follow me. You, You honor me, and I will honor you, which is true for all of us in the room today. If, if you honor God with the choices that you make today, here's the good news. God says, I will honor you. In the top 10 of the Ten Commandments, Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17, top two, don't have any other gods, right? Don't play the harlot. Don't be adulterous. Don't run after another god. I'm your god. I'm your husband. So number one, top 10 commandments. Number one, don't have any other gods. Number two is similar to it. Don't don't make any graven image. Now, for us, we, we got to keep number one in mind because I don't think most of us in the room, we're not going home and making lid, wooden carvings of false gods, right? But we all have false gods in our life. We have idols that are, we chase after and we think are going to fulfill us. And there, for as many people in the room today, there might be as many different idols that we have represented. Whatever we think is going to save us. If I only, you fill in the blank, it could be a person, it could be a thing, it could be a career, it could be a certain amount of money, it could be a lot of different things. In verse 2 of Exodus 20, I want to just highlight this, because this is the vows of God and his bride, right? It says, if you, if you do not honor me and you choose to go your own way, there will be consequences of sin that will follow you. And it won't just follow you, but it'll follow your children and your grandchildren. That's the reality. God, God, God's clear on that in his word. He loves us. Oh, man, does he love us. But he's also clear. If you choose to go this way or you choose to go this way, know that there's, there's going to be some consequences that follow you and your kids and your grandkids. Even though they didn't make that choice, the consequences of the decisions that we make will long li- outlive me. That's, that's the truth of God's word. But then you continue on that same verse. But those who honor me, my love and grace and mercy will be passed down for how many generations? Thousands of generations. You want something to last? Honor God with the way you live your life. Now, this year... This past year, I hit a significant milestone. I, I turned the big 5 So I'm, I'm coming to grips with some things. Um, one is, there's a day coming where nobody's going to remember me. Now, some of you, you, you've come to grips with that, and others of you are like, what? No, no, I'm always going to be remembered, right? Here, here's the reality. There's a day coming where I'm hoping my kids remember me. 
I, I'm, I'm hoping. Maybe their, their kids, that would be my grandchildren, and if I'm lucky, maybe great-grandchildren. Might get to meet them, right? But after that, nobody's going to remember my name. I'm, I'm gone. On this earth, no one's going to remember you. You're like, what did you learn at church today? No one's going to remember me. Wow, it was dark and depressing and sad. <laughs> God's, God's going to remember you. God will remember you, and he will remember the decisions that you're making today, and he will honor those decisions for thousands of generations. People will benefit from your choices today who you will never, ever, 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 ever meet. That's how, that's how good it is. That's how good it is. That's how good God is. And we choose to honor him. He says, those who honor me, I will honor so what happened in this marriage relationship? In Hosea chapter 4, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to sum up, sum up the rest of the book of Hosea, then we're going to come back to focus on maybe the greatest chapter in the entire Bible. Hosea chapter 4, hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel, for the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. They're swearing and lying and murder, stealing and committing adultery. They break all bonds and bloodshed follows bloodshed. So Hosea now is preaching. He's been living out this life of being this faithful husband, raising kids on his own, single dad parenting. He's doing all of this. Now God says, now I want you to go and preach. I've got some messages for you. So Hosea 4, first message, God has an indictment. He's bringing a case. He's bringing a lawsuit against the nation of Israel. It's like, hey, what's, what's up? I've kept my end of the deal, but nation of Israel, you, you haven't. So Hosea chapter 4, there's a, there's a case brought up. In fact, Hosea 4 through 10 is this case that Hosea brings against the nation of Israel. And what Hosea does is he brings up a few things. He brings up the 40 years in the wilderness. You guys... You wandered around, and you didn't honor God. And while he's getting the Ten Commandments, he comes down. You guys are already building false gods. And he brings up, uh, for those maybe familiar with stories, it's okay if you're not, Jacob lying. They bring up all these different stories of the Old Testament. Hosea brings these up as cases against the nation of Israel. And then he says, and you continue to offer sacrifices to God. And while you're doing that, you're offering sacrifices to other gods, too, as if nothing's wrong. It's like, I, I have a case against you on that. In fact, he is justified in divorce. Right? What Hosea is saying in chapter 4 is God is justified to divorce his people. He has every reason, has every case, as she plays the harlot, as the nation of Israel plays the harlot. There's a couple other themes that happen in Hosea 4 through 10. I'm going to sum them up for you. One is a word that Hosea continues to bring up, and that's his, that's his Hebrew word for knowledge. And it's yada. Maybe you've heard of it. Yada, yada. Anybody heard of that? Yada. Say it with me. Yada. Yada. You learned Hebrew today. What does yada mean? It means knowledge. But it means more than that. You add the A-K onto it. Acknowledge. Knowledge and acknowledge is very different. We all know things, but we don't put that knowledge to use, Right? I mean, there's a whole lot of things we know, but we don't allow that knowledge to drip down into our heart, and it changes us who we are. Yada is, I don't just know about someone, I know this person. And what Hosea is, part of his case, the nation of Israel, is you know about God, but you don't know God. You, you know a whole lot. You're playing religion. You're going to church, but you don't know God, is what he's saying. Do you know God today? Do you know about God or do you know God? Do you yada God, yada? Hosea is like, do you know God? Do you know his heart? Do you really know who he is? Because if we really understood who God is, we're not chasing after anything else, All right? If we really woke up every morning before our feet hit the floor, the first conversation we we're having is with God, and because our head hits the pillow, the last conversation we're having is, is with God. Because the personal relationship, that's... Because he's good, and he loves us, and he cares about us. This time of year, I love to hike. This is the best place in the world to hike right now in Arizona, right? 
and everybody knows it, and they're clogging up my trails. <laughs> like, where are all you people? Which is really frustrating when I'm trying to make a PR, personal record, up to the top. And they stop and ask me, can you take our pictures? I'm like, no. Get out of my way. Right? <laughs> True confessions with you. I love to hike. And the trails are so crowded now, some of these trails, you've got to go around people. And the trail is only like 12 inches wide, right? Well, in Arizona, when you get off the trail, things happen. There's a whole lot of things off the trail that are ready to get you, stick you, prick you. I don't even know the names of half these plants, but they're dangerous. And you, you think you're just going to slip on by them, but I think they move and they jump out and they reach and they prick you. And you don't realize it at the time, but you get home, you're like, man, there's like poison in those, those spikes. And I've got tweezers for the next 12 days trying to get all these, uh, these out. And it was just a split second. I got off the trail, right? And there's, there's pain. There's hurt. I was with some friends the other day. We were coming down. It was, it was afternoon. The sun's shining. And, and I said, hey, this is about the time of day that be, be on the lookout for some rattlesnakes. Snakes come out this time of day. And it's getting warm. And, and so be on the lookout. And literally about two minutes later, he stops, he jumps off, and right off the trail is a, a rattlesnake. Now, uh, I think he was about eight foot long. He, he was probably three foot, but, you know, <laughs> about eight feet long. When you get off the trail, what Hosea is saying, this is God's covenant with the nation of Israel. What he's saying is, when you get off the trail, there's some consequences. Right? And God is the perfect parent. God's not a parent like I am. And I, I, there were times my wife and I, we would either over-parent, right? We were th that, maybe that hovering parent where we were a little protective. They call them helicopter parents. If anybody can hear, like, we're going to really protect. God isn't that, and he's not the over-permissive parent. Well, I don't care. Do whatever you want. Just go, go, go do whatever you want. God's the perfect parent. And so... He loves us, and so he gives us boundaries. He cares about us. He wants what's best for us. He's the perfect parent. And so in Hosea, he makes this case, Hosea chapters 4 through 10. And then what's really interesting, he, he, he moves from the illustration of marriage to Hosea 11. He moves to the illustration of parenting. Hosea chapter 11. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. When did Israel get its start? When he pulled, right, gathered them up out of Egypt, the whole Pharaoh, the plagues, if that rings a bell. So God's forming a nation. What do you need for a nation? People, law, and land. So he's, he's got the people, right? So he brings them up out of Egypt. Israel's a son. He called them my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. Any parents in the room? You remember, there's some significant moments in parenting that you remember when, when they took their first walk. God remembers when Israel was just getting started. It was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that it was I who healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, with the hands or bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaws, and I bent down to them to feed them. What do you do with small children? You bend down, you get down on their level, eye to eye. You, right? Some of you, you're playing with your kids, you're playing with your grandkids, you're getting down. It's hard to get back up, but you get down. God gets down to the nation of Israel. Hey, I remember when you were born. I, I fed you. I took care of you. I picked you up into my arms. So Hosea chapter 11 is Israel as a rebellious son. Right? Hosea is painting the picture here, trying to help the nation of Israel understand this is who you are. You are now a rebellious son. You're not just an adulterous woman. You're also a rebellious son. Guess what Hosea chapter 12 and 13 is about? Israel as a rebellious teenager. Parents in the room who've raised some teenagers, right? You don't need to say amen or hallelujah, but you know what I'm talking about, right? Rebellious son, now rebellious teenager. And God's like, I'm the perfect parent. Listen, parents, I don't know who needs to hear this today. Your value and your worth as a parent is not found in the value and worth of your kids. 
If that were true, then what would that say about God's worth as a value as God? God is perfect. There's some discussion that when God had a conversation with Adam and Eve, he said, hey, let's see how you like it to make somebody in your own image and have them turn their back on you. Right? That's parenting. You make somebody in your own image and then you turn their back on you. God can relate. God, God can relate. Every day he can relate. And what does God do? He says, here's the boundaries for which you're to live life. Here's the boundaries of our relationship. I will, I will choose to love you unconditionally. It will go better for you if, you if you honor me. So he makes this case all through Hosea. And then he comes to Hosea chapter 14, which is nine verses. And it's a, it's a really unique chapter full of incredible hope. Hosea 14. Hosea 14 says, Return, O Israel, to the Lord your God. Right? Return is the first word. The, the whole theme of the book of Hosea is this idea of return. Right? Repent. Return. Why? Just because God wants, wants to be this over-demanding father figure telling you what to do? No. Return because it will go well for you. It will be better for you. Be less ways for you to be injured and hurt along the journey of life. Return, O Israel, the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take with you words and return to the Lord and say to him, take away all iniquity except what is good, and we will pay with bulls the vows of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses. So the nation of Israel is looking for military might and kings to save them. They're chased after other idols. They're looking for these idols to save them. And we will then say, no more, our God, to the work of our hands, in you the orphan finds mercy. Now, one of the most powerful verses of Hosea 4, and we've read a lot of powerful verses in the book of Hosea, is Hosea 14, verse 4. I will heal their apostasy. I will heal them. Anything that has happened in your life that has brought about pain, that has brought about brokenness, that has brought about regret, God says to you today, I will heal them. Who will heal? God will bring about healing in your life. Let's lay that list down. God says, I will heal you. I will heal them. I will love them freely. Some translation says, there is no limit to my love. Right? Now, we all have limits. Come on, if we're honest, right? We all have limits. You, you, you push up against me enough, right? We're, we're all impatient people. God says, the God who created you says his love. He says, my love has no limits. Hosea 14.4 might be your new favorite verse. I will love them freely for my anger has turned from them. He had every reason to divorce them. He had a case against them. He spends 10 chapters saying, this is all the things you've done wrong, but I will choose to love you. That is good news. My love, God, I don't know the God that you were taught, but this is the God of the Bible, and the God of the Bible here today we're talking about says that his love has no limits. His anger has been turned away from you. A couple other themes throughout, throughout Hosea. One is this idea of jealousy. I don't know if you've you heard this, that God is a jealous God. I remember first hearing that when I was a kid, like, how can God be jealous? Isn't we were, my mom's always saying, don't be jealous, right? Jealousy is a sin. So how can God be jealous? What does it mean when the Bible says that God is a jealous God? Whatever it means, it cannot refer to imply anything sinful in God. He is a holy God and is never sinfully jealous. He's never jealous because he is needy or greedy or covetous or because he's lazy and unwilling to put forth the effort necessary to accomplish his purposes. God is not jealous because he takes a petty dislike to certain individuals and begrudges their achievements or because he's frustrated with his position in the universe. Such suggestions are absurd from J.I. Packard in the book Knowledge of a Holy. But he says... It is, holy, it is his holiness reacting to evil 
in a way that is morally right and precious. It is a praiseworthy zeal on his part to preserve something supremely precious. God is jealous for you. What is that supremely precious thing? You. He's a jealous God. It says that in the Ten Commandments. He's a jealous God. Why? Because there is evil out to destroy your life. And the things that we run to and we find in the arms of another lover that we chase after on this planet that we think will save us and fulfill us, God knows that is going to harm us and destroy us. And John 10.10 says the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus says, but I have come to give you life. Why is God a jealous God? Because he knows everything else that we're going to chase after will only hurt you. And he is a perfect parent who does not want to see that happen to you. And so he is a jealous God. He's jealous for you. Regardless of what you've done, what you've chased after in your life, he's jealous for you. God's jealousy is linked to his love. And that's the whole story of Hosea. He's so jealous for Gomer. Jealous for her. And we read this story and we're like, are you kidding me? He should run away from Gomer. We don't think like God thinks. God says, no, I'm going to outbid every one for her. I'm going to buy her back. There's also this idea of God's love. Another Hebrew word, ahava. Say that with me, ahava. You guys are learning Hebrew today. It's a Hebrew word. It means love. There's a love, very general word. It means a lot of different things. It's not obsession. It's not infatuation. It's not a feeling. It's this decision made. And in Scripture, we see this word ahava, Hebrew word for love. It's the same love that Abraham has for Isaac. So it's a parental love. It's a brotherly love that David has with Jonathan, a brotherly love. It's the love that a nation has for their king. It's the love that the nation of Israel had for David, their king. It's this brotherly love. Love. It's the love that John writes about that we love because God first loved us. You and I today can have Avala because God had that for us. We reflect the unconditional love of God. And every, anytime we love someone, and there's all, we all have people in our life that are really hard to love. So look at me. We all have people in our life that are really difficult to love. What does it require to love someone when I don't want to love them? It requires a substitutionary. You guys know what substitute means? Sacrifice. There's a cost involved for me to love someone that I don't want to love. There's a cost. Cost of time. Cost of effort cost of the feelings that I want to feel of, you know, revenge, whatever it may be. There's a sacrifice for me to show someone else the type of love that God has shown to me. Substitutionary love. So we talked about knowing God or knowing about God. We talked about the love of God. We talked about the jealousy that God has for us. Now, in understanding of all of that, James Montgomery Boyce, who is a Presbyterian pastor in Philadelphia, he wrote a commentary on the book of Hosea. In Hosea chapter 3, he calls the greatest chapter of the Bible. I don't know if you would agree, but maybe by the end of today. We looked at it last week, but I want to come back to it. Because if it's not the greatest chapter, it's at least in the running. Hosea chapter 3. Let me read it for you. And the Lord said to me, this is, this is after his wife has left him, is now in the red, white, light district. She's a prostitute, and her pimp is putting her up for sale. Breaking it down, that's Kyle's paraphrase. And the Lord said to me, go again. Love a woman who is loved by another man and is an adulteress, even as the Lord loves the children of Israel. Though they turn to other gods and loves cakes of raisins. They 
using a gift that God said to worship him. They're using it for some, something else. And buy her back for 15 shekels of silver and a homer and a lithbeck of barley. That adds up to be 30 pieces of silver. Does this ring a bell, 30 pieces of silver? Hundreds of years before Christ comes. And I said to her, you must dwell as mine for many days. You shall not play the whore or belong to another man. So will I also be to you. So he goes and he buys her back. And he outbids. And she's standing there naked, maybe with her eyes closed. And he, he buys her back for 30 pieces of silver. What's equivalent to 30 pieces of silver? It's about a half a year's salary. And he probably puts a coat around her and and brings her home, and, and what does he say to her when he gets home? You shall not play the whore or belong to another man, for I will also be to you. For the children of Israel shall dwell many days without king or prince. So what's happening in this text is everyone in this room, no matter what you've done or what's been done to you, is worth buying back. God will outbid any, any other God that this world will has that you're chasing after. God will outbid. But then the second half of chapter 3, he says, hey, there's going to be a season of time where this relationship's going to be repaired. When I bring you home, we're not going to sleep together. There's a period of time there's going to be this intimacy needs to be restored. What, what's happening here? He's got to remember, this is prophecy. So he's talking to the nation of Israel and said, nation of Israel... You're going to be conquered by Assyria. We're, we're going to come back together. You're, go, you're my people. You'll always be my people. But there's going to be a season where you won't have a king. There's going to be a season where this relationship needs to be repaired. And that's, that's actually really good advice. That's, this is really good marriage counseling. If, if this has happened in your marriage, this would be, hey, we take, take a time out here. There needs to be work for that relationship to be restored. Maybe that speaks to someone here today, like, hey, I've, I've run away from God, and now I recognize that he loves me, and he's buying me back, and he's paid the price for me, and it's going to take some time. You don't just push a button, and everything's great again. You accept his love and grace and mercy, and as you do that, it begins to change some things in your, in your life. You begin to see things differently and more, more clearly. Afterwards, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God, and David their king... And they shall come and fear the Lord into his goodness in the latter days. Now, he mentions David. Who's the descendant of David? Jesus. Jesus comes. And Jesus ultimately is betrayed with a kiss and 30 pieces of silver. And he, he goes to the cross and pays the price for you and for me. And to that accusation that, and to that case that Hosea chapter 4 brings up, the charge against Israel. Here's, here's the good news today. Jesus is our attorney and his portfolio is his payment. He stands before his Father in heaven. Every time we sin, he doesn't make a new payment. He doesn't have to go to the cross for every time that we sin. Every time we sin, he doesn't make a new payment. He doesn't die again and again and again and again. Instead, he simply opens up his portfolio and shows the evidence. He lays the exhibits of Good Friday on the bench before the judge. And the photographs of that evidence include the crown of thorns and the lashing and the mocking soldiers and the agonies of the cross and the final cry of victory, which he says, it is finished. Anything, decision that we've made in our life that has been off the trail, Jesus has paid that price for you and it does not need to control you any longer. God's love is greater than our sin. Any sin that you've ever committed the sin that you think about every day that might have a hold of you, it's got a capture of your mind, you think about often, you can let that go and you can drop it before the king of kings. And his name is Jesus because he paid the price for that. It no longer needs to control you. Jesus says in Matthew 11, come to me all you who are weary. And some of us have heavy baggage. And Jesus says, come to me. You see, you don't climb a mountain to come to Jesus, you collapse. You fall at his feet. You drop it all at his feet. He's our perfect husband. Jesus is the better Hosea. Hosea points to Jesus. 
And today you have that opportunity. If there's something in your life that you, you think about way too often, it's got control over you. I, I can't imagine the recovery process that Gomer went through. I'm sure there was a process that she had to walk through. The things that she had been, the way she had been treated and abused. Hosea 14. Hosea 14, the rest of the chapter, paints a really incredible, beautiful picture of this tree that bears fruit, that grows, the roots go way down, it grows, and it's beautiful. And I believe that's the church. It's a beautiful tree. It's, it's a tree where growth is restored, beauty is restored, strength is restored. Now think about Gomer. We're Gomer. And what does God do with each and every one of us? He restores us. He restores our beauty. He restores our strength. He restores our value. He restores our delight. He restores our abundance. It says in Hosea 14, his branches will spread. We're the blessing that God blessed Abraham. He said, through you, all nations will be blessed. And we get to be a part of that today. The good news that we are hearing and reading about is the result of God's unconditional love for you. He loves you. He sees you today. He knows you. He knows every detail of your life. He knew everything Gomer ever did. And he says, that's who I want. He loves you. He sees you today. Would you pray with me? God, it's hard to comprehend and hard to imagine that you are jealous for us. I pray that for this good news as it moves throughout this room through the power of your Holy Spirit that we would be reminded of the worth that we have because we were created by you. As a church, we'd be reminded of the beauty that we have as the bride of Jesus, the church, the bride of Jesus. Made up of broken, sinful people. But you declare us good and right. And for anyone who's never placed their faith and trust in you, recognizing that you are bidding today, you are bidding for them. And it is your desire to buy them back. I pray that they would simply say yes. Say yes and return to you. I pray you'd move in the room as we close our service with, with worship this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I want to take a moment to say thank you for joining us for today's service online. I'm going to invite you to our website where there are a number of different action steps to take following today's service. Maybe joining a small group or finding a place to serve, or sending a prayer request into the church to let us know how we can help you and how we can be praying for you. If you found this message today encouraging and supportive, I'm going to ask you to like or share or comment. And let us know and, and share that with your friends. If it's been an encouragement to you, I trust you'll be an encouragement to others as you share this resource. Hey, we've been praying for you. We're going to continue to pray for you throughout this week and trust you'll join us again next weekend. Have a great week.